From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A Fairbanks woman is being held without bail after authorities say she shot and killed a man and then buried his body in the backyard. 49-year-old Monica Forbes was arraigned this afternoon in Fairbanks District Court. She's charged with the first-degree murder of Michael Pope and an additional tampering with physical evidence charge. According to charging documents, a co-worker of Pope reported him missing in late November after he failed to return calls and texts. During an investigation, troopers found Pope's vehicle with a bloodstained mattress and pillow inside. On Monday, troopers say Forbes confessed to the homicide and further admitted to burying Pope near her cabin's outhouse. Troopers uncovered Pope's remains shortly after. Fairbanks police are investigating a stabbing that occurred at about 8 last night in the 1600 block of Mary Ann Street. A woman identified as 31-year-old Betty Ann Matthews was found lying beside the road bleeding heavily. She was taken to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital and at last report was listed in critical condition. Police say it appears that she received over 20 stab wounds. Investigation continues into possible suspects and motive. Anyone with information about the case is asked to call Detective Scott Adams at 459-6552. No bail for a Fairbanks man accused of felony assault and arson. Timothy Hauger of Fairbanks was arraigned this afternoon in Fairbanks District Court. Hauger is facing numerous felonies after authorities say he attacked a couple and set fire to their tent. According to charging documents, Hauger was angered over a pack of stolen cigarettes when he attempted to strangle and beat the man with a blowtorch. The girlfriend of the victim said she feared for her life and hit Hauger over the head with a small heater until he stopped the attack. Hauger was reportedly high on drugs at the time of the incident. One of the men charged in connection with the homicide of a Fairbanks man outside a local bar has been granted a lower bail amount. Demarius Hinson appeared in Fairbanks Superior Court yesterday and his bail was lowered to $35,000. However, as part of his conditions of release, Hinson would have to be under the 24-hour surveillance of a court-approved third-party custodian. Hinson was also ordered to be monitored by a GPS ankle monitor should he be able to post the monetary bail amount. Hinson has pleaded not guilty to a single count of felony hindering prosecution after authorities say he and the other men fled the state after an altercation that led to the shooting death of John Kaverlik Jr. That was outside the Rock and Rodeo Bar. Now another man, Joel Joseph, is set to be arraigned on the actual murder charges of Kaverlik next Tuesday. Last night, 21 prospective nonprofit organizations made their pitch to the City of Fairbanks Hotel Motel Discretionary Fund Committee for a slice of the funding pie. The Hotel Motel Discretionary Fund is a collection of funds generated from the city bed tax, which is a mandatory fee for guests visiting hotel locations in Fairbanks. Mayor John Eberhardt. Mayor John Eberhardt used the fund's anticipated revenue for the city next fiscal year as about $2.8 million. Organizations like the World Eskimo Indian Olympics, Yukon Quest, Festival of Fairbanks, Ice Alaska, and many more applied for the funding. The final determination to distribute funds will be held at noon this Friday in city council chambers. $270,000 will be spread out to chosen organizations this year. Committee Chairman and City Council Member Jim Matherly said he was excited to see so many organizations doing their part in Fairbanks. So people who get bored up here, I usually say, you're nuts. <laughs> so I appreciate what all of you do to help this town. I just wish we had 10, 10 times the amount of money to give away to all these organizations. And, and so we really do appreciate what all of you do. During the Fairbanks City Council meeting on Monday, Mayor John Eberhardt called up Human Resources Director Angela Foster Snow to testify regarding employees leaving their jobs. The city of Fairbanks lost eight senior employees in the span of two years. This includes the city public information officer, a Fairbanks city manager, and multiple department directors. Mayor Eberhardt maintains that the main cause of turnover is due to high mandatory insurance rates and low wages. However, council members Jim Matherly and Jerry Cleworth express doubt, implying it's not due to salary. Foster Snow says three of the eight employees were not disgruntled during exit interviews. However, she implored the council to share any details they have learned about former employees. If, if those conversations are happening, if you can send them back to HR, because in order for the city to change things or make changes, we have to have that information, okay? We have to have those tools in order to step, step forward, and that's really what we want to do right now is to move forward. When we come back, if the current trend continues, Alaskans could see gas prices fall to the lowest rate since 2009. 
Also, more moose are appearing on local roads, so much that DOT has issued a warning for motorists to be on the lookout for moose on roads here in the interior. Stay with us. And welcome back. If current trends continue by year's end, gas prices nationwide could be as low as they were during the 2008 recession and possibly as low as they were in the 1970s. Today, the national average is $2.01 per gallon, and that's expected to be below $2 within the next couple of days. Alaska's average is 32 cents more than that, but that's the lowest price the state has seen since 2009. Senior petroleum analyst Patrick Dehan of GasBuddy.com said over production, overproduction of oil is causing the low prices. He says it's good for the motoring public, but not so much for states like Alaska that depend on oil revenue. Well, it's got to be a double-edged sword for living in a state of Alaska, which uh, has been producing less and less oil over the years. But it's really just a, an account of oil inventories that are brimming with product and OPEC's failure to cut production to rein in that excess supply. It's nice to see low gas prices, but it's not that nice to see tens of thousands of, of workers being laid off, which you know could eventually lead to an economic slowdown. The Department of Transportation released a warning for motorists to watch out for moose on the roads. Each year, Alaskans are involved with over 10,000 moose-related motor vehicle collisions. Folks from the interior are urged to use extra care while driving this holiday season. The long nights and icy roads make moose spotting very difficult. A few winter driving habits to remember are drive according to weather conditions and watch out for cow moose. A calf could be near. So this time of year, we really remind drivers to watch for moose on the road. We tend to see an increase in crashes involving moose because there's less daylight and people tend to not see them. So there are a couple of tips that we give drivers. Um, the first one is to make sure that you allow enough space between you and the vehicle in front of you. Also make sure that you're always driving with your headlights on even during our few daylight hours that we have right now. And then always be on the lookout for moose. So kind of in your peripheral vision as you're driving, try to scan the sides of the road and see what you can see. And Nationwide retail sales and job numbers during the holiday season are sometimes used as indicators for how companies will fare during the rest of the year. Mike Fussell reports that may not be the case here in Alaska. The holidays are a time for giving and nationwide retail sales and job increases reflect just that. In the last three months alone, around 755,000 jobs were added to the U.S. economy, according to a state labor department report. But in Alaska's heavily seasonal job market, economist Alyssa Rodriguez says gift giving and getting doesn't make as big of a mark. We see an increase that kind of starts in October nationwide and then it really jumps up in November and then goes up even further in December. Our pattern is, is very different. We have a huge increase in the summer. Fairbanksans did see a small increase of employment around the holidays compared to other regions in the state like Juneau. Local hiring agencies say job seekers get creative this time of year. You know, merchandising. We want to re-merchandise the stores for the Christmas, for the holiday season. Um, I don't know how many times you've been in the store, but sometimes they get a little messy in the, at Christmas. Um, just different things that take place during this time of year. A lot of banquets and Christmas parties and things like that that need temporary employees. State economists say the small hiring increase in Fairbanks typically ends earlier than in other places around the country. Rodriguez says that might have a lot to do with the extra spending money related to the permanent fund dividend. There was a little increase going from October to November, uh, both in 2013 and in 2014. So we did kind of see a little secondary bump um, for holiday spending. It didn't continue to go up in December, but I think, but I think that November peak might be a holdover from PFD. You know, people spending that money a little bit later, shopping a little bit late. People are spending the most on furniture, electronics, and other general merchandise during the last several months of the year, according to the Alaska Labor Department report. But the biggest statewide hiring boom is in the summer. That's thanks to construction and tourism, among other industries. Reporting, I'm Mike Fussell. All right, Joe Cook is up next with sports, and he has more high school basketball team previews. The West Valley boys and Lathrop girls are in the spotlight tonight. All right, all that and more with Joe after the break.
Welcome back into your Alaska. Joe Cook here with your local Wednesday sports cast. We continue our prep basketball team previews this evening. This time we go to the west side of town. Last year, the West Valley Wolfpack got over the hump by winning the Mac boys basketball title. Now with the new coach and new players, they'll have to defend it. Here's more on the West Valley boys. I think the biggest pressure is just to be successful no matter where you go. And that's what I'm trying to do here. That's probably the biggest pressure on myself is to come to a new program and prove that I can have success no matter where I go. Cornelius Mingo is the new head coach of the West Valley Wolfpack boys team. He coached at Alston the past two seasons and takes over for Kamani Shotwell. With talented veteran players on his roster, it'll be hard for West Valley to take a step back this year. The expectation is just uh, be a team. Uh, don't let any egos get in the way. Don't let any personalities get in the way because you're right. You do have a lot of talent. You have kids that are, that are good at every position, that can play several positions. But just remember, we're here for the team concept first and a win is a win no matter how we get it. West Valley has an intriguing roster. Brandon Bones Joyner, Sean Kinsey, and All-State guard Daniel Hornbuckle are notable returners. But they had some key off-season acquisitions. Former Lathrop guard Jaden Whiteside will look to make his debut in January, and the coach's son Cornelius Mingle Jr. will make the jump from 3A to 4A competition. Working on my defense mainly this off-season, um, just making sure I get low, play hard knock defense the whole game, um, look for better shots than I did last year, make sure I just look for key openings in the defense and attack those holes that they leave open and just play ball. Last season, the Wolfpack won the MAC title for the first time in a decade. Now they have the target on their backs, which is very different for them. Last year, we needed that, we needed that W to go to state, so that was a, it was a must win for us. So I know this year, we're not going to come in thinking that we're going to be like running through all the teams because we know that we got to still play hard, still do everything we can to come back and win another regional title. So it's not just going to be easy. We're going to have to fight. So The Wolfpack opened their season on Friday night at Hutchison at 6 p.m. for the next door neighbor rivalry. And this rivalry will be one to see this year. These games will no doubtly be packed. West Valley and the Lathrop girls, the Malamutes are fired up to right the wrongs of last season and maybe take down arguably the best team in the state who happens to be in their conference. Let's go to Lathrop. There's a lot of energy in Lathrop's gym this week, but the Lathrop girls team suffered heartbreak last year, coming up short in the winning percentage index for making the state tournament. This season, it's state or bust for a team that returns a talented and deep group. We call it a point five. We were point five away from making it to the state uh, tournament last year, so we building off of that. The girls have matured more, you know, sophomores are now juniors, and uh, they've been putting in the work over the summer. We talked about roll call over the summer, what your role going to be this year. Work on what's your role. Do your job. If everybody do their job, we're looking for bigger and better things this year. Before they can clinch a state berth, they'll have to get enough wins to avoid last year's heartbreak and face their rival, the West Valley Wolfpack, the 2015 state runner-up and reigning MAC champs. Let's just say the Malamutes have those dates circled in red. We, I want them bad. It'll be fun. I love Ruthie to death. She's my teammate, my friend, and competitor. We're looking forward to playing against West Valley and um, taking them this year. That's definitely our what we're focusing on. Head coach David Stewart has a determined squad that has a lot of high expectations for themselves. My goal is Gatorade Player of the Year, of course. That's always my biggest goal, and I really want that. It's going to be hard competing with Ruthie, but I'm up for the challenge, and I want to make it to stay and be a state champ as a sophomore. Hey, we can win it all. You know, what we can do, well, we, we, we say we're going to win state. You know, that's our goal. You know, no other goal but win it all, one game at a time. The Lathrop Malamutes start their 2015-2016 campaign this Friday night, hosting the Allison Ravens at 7.30 on Joe T. Court. Well, this will be very interesting to see, no doubt. Now we announce the Pro Football Challenge winner, and that winner for Week 14 is Wilson R. Watt. Congratulations, Wilson. You win a large one-topping pizza from Pizza Hut. Wilson had a nice week, making 13 out of 16 picks correct, and he also won the tiebreaker to get that pizza. And as we look at the latest standings, Scott is the new clubhouse leader with 133 points. New England Pats fan 89 is second with 131. Arctic Fireman and the Bear AK are both tied third with 130. Five are tied in fourth place with fourth place with 129 points and three are tied in fifth place. Really tight. Three weeks remain in the PFC and there's been a little separation but each week left as like the playoffs as like the playoffs. And as for users battling for that generator from the outpost 
um, for the grand prize. Getting your picks for week 15 Thursday night football pits the Tampa Bay Buccaneers against the St. Louis Rams. And that'll do it for sports tonight. Thanks for watching. Mike Schultz is next with your full weather forecast and we'll catch you next time. Hey everyone, welcome back. Mike Schultz with you once again talking about the weather and we had clouds around today, but all in all it wasn't too bad. We're looking at uh, cold temperatures to continue and then a slight warming into the weekend and then after that uh, interesting weather. We'll talk about that later on. Our photograph for tonight, this one's sent in by Anna Ross, a sunset from UAF. You can see the the uh, mountains on the horizon there. And as always, if you have a photograph to share, especially Christmas time, send it to uh, photos at ktbf11.com. And once again, a reminder, the uh, Fab Photo calendars are going fast. These are the last places that have them around town. Personnel Plus, Ice Fog Vapor, 907 Organic, Big Daddy's Barbecue, Graphic North, and the Prescription Center. They are free and they're good stocking stuffers. So drop by one of those areas and they'll, they'll pick them out for you. Today's high one degree above the low last night, nine below the record high 41 in 2005, the record low 53 below in 1946. And our sunrise and sunset, three hours and 47 minutes. That is a loss of two minutes from yesterday. On our satellite and radar, a pretty good storm sitting down in the Gulf of Alaska. The circulation with a counterclockwise helping to spring, spread clouds up. But most of the moisture, once again, is being blocked out by the Alaska Range. As you can see, the Fairbanks area not really receiving anything. But there are showers down to the south and a little bit more rain moving back in over southeast Alaska. And speaking of southeast Alaska, their temperature today was only 30 degrees at Juneau with mixed rain and snow there. And Ketchikan, a very cold rainfall, 36. There was some snow falling around the Anchorage Bowl, 25 degrees. Kodiak at 40 degrees with rain along the Aleutian Chain, Cold Bay 31, and uh, some showers there. Up and down the West Coast, we're looking at temperatures once again cooling down. 17 degrees at Nome, 15 to Bethel, 1 below at Barrow, and Fort Yukon exactly 0 degrees. Lower 48 weather. This area of low pressure moving off into the Great Lakes area and more cold temperatures and more, more storminess moving down across the, much of the western half of the country. It shows up on our stormy situation expected tomorrow. Flooding, mudslides, snow to rain in Oregon all the way down, well, from Washington all the way down to Oregon and gusty winds along the coast and mountains as that frontal system arrives. Now the jet stream is going to be taking a little bit of a change now. As you can see over the weekend, a little more of a dip across the northwest, bringing more rain and snow. Warmer air being pushed back up from the south into the uh, central plains and over the Great Lakes, looking at uh, some showers there. All right, our, once again, our weather watched for today. And in 1988, here in Fairbanks, we set a record high of 41 degrees, which was 43 degrees above the normal temperatures, and it was freezing rain. Oh, what a mess that was. Thanks again to Mal McKinley Bank for sponsoring our kids' weather. And again, when they return from Christmas vacation January 5th, the kids from Salsha Elementary School will be joining us for our weather watch. All right, here's our forecast for tomorrow across the northern sections. Cloudy skies at Barrow, partly cloudy in Nome, scattered clouds for Fort Yukon. Here in the interior, a very quiet weather forecast, mostly cloudy in Fairbanks, isolated snow showers for Healy and Delta Junction. Over southeast Alaska, it looks like the rain and snow are going to return for both Juneau and Ketchikan with temperatures near 40 degrees, a little cooler in Juneau. Over the southwest portion of the state, the snow showers at Cold Bay and Kodiak and partly cloudy skies in Bethel. And around the south central regions, looking at mostly cloudy skies at Anchorage, isolated showers in Homer and snow for Valdez. And our our air quality alert for tonight. Well, once again, it uh, looks like Fairbanks is at moderate levels in a stage two category. Once again, for the folks in North Pole with moderate levels, that alert is good through 5 p.m. tomorrow night. Our forecast for tonight, partly cloudy, continued cold, 10 degrees below zero. Tomorrow's forecast calling for four above, cloudy skies, snow showers later in the evening, and the extended forecast calling for some snow showers hanging around for Friday morning. Then after that, the next chance for any snow will be the middle first to part to middle part of next week but temperatures will start dropping pretty good in fact the long range outlook is calling for temperatures dropping down to maybe close to 30 below by christmas eve no that's my no. birthday what are we well, well, they just got it all wrong. <laughs> 30 below, although I am supposed to be the dreaded 30. Yes. Yeah, I don't want it to match there. my 
Big 3-0. Oh, oh, to match the temperature. This is only Wednesday. Things can change. Well, that's what it looks like, right? Yeah. Officially yeah. old. Yes, that's right. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Mike, I guess. <laughs> then we'll wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. We are glad you could join us. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, for the first time in nearly a decade, the, federal, the Fed raised the interest rate by a quarter of a point. That's up next with Lester Holt. And do remember the holiday toy drives continuing at Walmart. Please drop your toys in the big box at the store so the United Way can distribute them for Christmas Day. All right, from all of us here at the News Center, we hope you have a good night. Good night.